Uh, as you know, our computer failed about 20 hours before retro. Uh, this wasn't uh, much of a problem. It, it was a, I guess it was a blow to my pride. I wanted to land on the after elevator on the Wasp. <laughs> I talked to the captain later, and he said he didn't want me to land there. <laughs> he was afraid it had hurt his ship. Uh, In fact, he kind of thought you might go right on down to the bottom deck. Uh, they'd, they'd actually discuss this before we came in. We had them worried, see. Uh, we, did, we did lose the computer, and we checked with the people on the ground. We never were able to get the computer back on the line. But uh, people on the ground, and Ed and I in the air, discussed the, the technique we'd used to come down. Uh, we'd gone through uh, this many times before on the ground, so it wasn't any big surprise to us. We all arrived at a uh, mutually satisfactory agreement. Uh, we performed the Ohm's retro fire at, uh, at uh, 12 minutes before firing our solid retro rockets. It was just as smooth as could be. At retro fire, we had all four of our rockets fire just exactly the way they should have, and it was uh, it was very nice feeling. We knew we were coming down, not where, but we knew we were coming down. And I certainly hoped it would be near the aircraft carrier. We had uh, one of the real major portions of this flight was the medical uh, data that could be learned from four days of weightlessness, and. I know there was a lot of controversy before flight about whether or not we would be able to take care of ourselves when we landed. And although Ed and I were convinced that we, that we would be, there were enough doubting Thomases so that we, we did give it a second thought. And when I was over in Korea, I always learned that the, the best way to survive was to get rescued early. So I, I wanted somebody there to rescue me early. And as a matter of fact, I think I called that out to Gus on the way down. He told me they'd have a helicopter over us in five minutes, and I said, that's fine with me, or, or something like that. So we, we, had a, we had a beautiful re-entry. It's a thing that'll really stick in my mind. The uh, retro adapter was jettisoned shortly after we had fired the retro rockets. And as we started down into the atmosphere, it, it floated out and got so that we could see it uh, just slightly behind us. It was just perfectly stable. Uh, shortly after we, it came into view, the, the leading edge of it started to glow. And then it just, uh, it, the glow became brighter, and it turned into a, a, a very bright flame, sort of, and the, the front part of the retro adapter eroded right off. And uh, we could see the thing back there, just as stable as could be, and, and burning up. About that time, we saw some pink flames coming, or pink light coming up around our spacecraft. It got oranger and then redder, and pretty soon we saw green. And it was uh, the most beautiful sight I've ever seen. The thing that impressed me most about the reentry was that we were actually able to see the ground. We saw ourselves pass across the United States. We went across Florida. Ed and I were talking about it all the time. I guess we talked as much in space as, <laughs> as we do on the ground. Uh, we have a we we put a special a, a tape in just before we started down and put the uh, put our uh, intercom system in the record position. I'd certainly like to to listen to this tape. It ought to be hilarious. We came on down and got to uh, 50,000 feet. Deployed the drogue chute as we should. Uh, we got down to 10,600 feet. Put out the main parachute. Uh, it worked fine. We descended into the water, and just slightly before we hit the water, I heard an, uh, one of the rescue planes say we have them in sight. And it was a mighty fine feeling. The helicopters were there in about five minutes, and I think we had swimmers in the water in about another five, and we had somebody, a frogman, peering through our window to see if we were alive in about another two or three, and we were peering there right back. <laughs> <laughs> I think that... Uh, that covers the flight in a nutshell, and I know you've got a lot of questions. Jim, let me, let me cover sure. one thing that, uh, that you missed on the reentry that I think was probably one of the inter oh, yes. most interesting <laughs> parts. As we came back in, you know, we were, they said, you're going to hit eight Gs, and we thought, well, we've been weightless out here for four days now. These Gs might be pretty tough. So we were both sitting in our seats with, you know, waiting for the Gs to come on, and and as uh, we felt the first G starting to build up, we pushed back into the seats and, and got ourselves all ready. And I, we could both feel them building up a little more and a little more. And, and uh, I think it was either Jim or I said, uh, gee, that feels like about two Gs now. And Jim had the G meter on his side. He said, well, it's not saying anything. And so we went on in. You know, we could feel the press harder back in the seat. And, uh, I thought, gee, these G's aren't going to be too bad. They don't feel too bad, but I sure do feel pushed down. And, and uh, I, I think at that time, I said, gee, it's feeling like about three or four G's. And Jim says, gee, it does to me too. And he says, but the G meter's still not doing anything. <laughs> he reached up and pushed the G meter to see if it was broken. And uh, the little G that, that uh, 
We'd had, when did that build up, the G that you pushed off on there? Oh, I think it probably built up at Retrofire. I don't think we had anything yeah, I yet. I think the G's, at, uh, about the uh, less than a half a G that we built up at Retrofire, he pushed off the G meter at this time. And uh, we began to suspect that perhaps the G meter was working. And then it slowly started to come up. It went up to one, two, three, and we felt that we'd really been had at that time. We'd been sitting there taking those three and four Gs, and we probably didn't even have enough to register on the G meter. It was probably more like, it was probably about two tenths or one tenth of a G. But uh, the surprising thing uh, was that the Gs build up to uh, two, three, four, and Jim was calling them out to me as we had in our simulations many times in the past. And he called them right out to me, five, six, seven. And uh, when we got down on the ground, we'd actually had about seven and a half Gs. And I think those were the most pleasant Gs I've ever had in my whole life. I'll the, second that. Uh, <laughs> the view throughout the whole period of time during the G loads, I think, was uh, spectacular. We were watching the, the colors in the fire as it uh, came around the spacecraft. I thought that the uh, G-loading would be something that you'd be very interested in. The doctors were quite interested in that. And I might add that throughout this thing, we were talking to the ground. I don't think, uh, they didn't hear us during the blackout, but we just kept talking and telling them what a good time we were having. And uh, finally, after we got down and on the drogue chute, I could hear Gus Grissom talking from Houston. Uh, but I couldn't understand him very, very well, and I was talking back, but I, I did get the information that they were going to have rescue forces there shortly, which, as I mentioned earlier, was a pleasant thought. Well, let's get into the Q&A. Uh, Bill Hines, wait for the microphone. Ed, it sounded from your account, it sounded from your account as though what, one thing you needed badly is a very reliable computer, and a group of my colleagues and I have got together and have arranged to present you one, which I have uh -oh. here. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly what Jim asked for. He said uh, to Gus, he says, Gus says, is there anything we can do for you before the re-entry? And Jim says, give me back my computer. <laughs> I think this is tremendous. <laughs> I might add that it says on the bottom, break glass in case of emergency. <laughs> this is what we needed. <laughs> I still have one question just, just, just a second, Bill. Just a second, Bill. My uh, question is this. Oh, just a second, I want to say something. This, isn't, this is too heavy to take on a flight. You'll have to come back with a lighter one. <laughs> Well, at least it's man-rated. The Chinese have been using them for 4,000 years. Uh, what I would like to ask is, uh, in, the t in the time of uh, Ed's EVA, there was some uh, interchange between the two of you to the effect that he had smeared up the windshield. And I was wondering, what was the nature of that smear? How did it affect the vision? What did it come from? Bill, I sure wished I knew. Uh, I took some pictures of this smear. Uh, it, it appeared as, as, as two different, entirely different things. At one time, with the light shining on it in one way, it looked like it was a black, opaque smear on the outside of the window. And at other times, with the light shining on the window in a different way, it looked like I had a light, thin, powdery film on the window, and in this particular area, that film had been scraped off. I don't know what it was, and we're, we're obviously looking into, what, into this problem. But I can't tell you at this time. Dick Lewis? Wait for the mic. White. I'd like to ask Major White uh, whether he felt some reluctance about coming back. It's, it sounded to us down on the ground as though uh, Major McDivitt was singing, please, Billy Bailey, please come home. How about that? I don't sing very well. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you in all sincerity and honesty that I enjoyed the EVA very much. I thought it was a wonderful opportunity that I had to represent the people of our country in this endeavor. And I can also tell you honestly, I was sorry to see it draw to a close. In about being reluctant to come in, I suppose personally I was reluctant to come in, but when the word came out that the, this phase of the mission was over, I knew it was time to come in. And this is when I started in. And there were certain things though that I had to do as I came back in and the conversation that you heard going back and forth between Jim and I were things that we were saying as I did the things that I 
had done to prepare for the EVA, I had to do these in reverse order to come back in. I had to take the camera off, as I mentioned prior, disconnect it, stow the cable that the camera was mounted uh, to. I had to take the umbilical guard off and uh, discard it, and then I had to get in position to come back in. So I can tell you that I was honestly uh, reluctant about coming back in because it was a wonderful part of the mission, but there was no doubt in my mind that when the flight director told me the mission this phase was over that it was time to come in. Charles Von Frey? Yeah. It's a question for uh, Ed. And, uh, I, I am curious as to what it was like uh, as we looked at those films when you actually stepped out. Did you have the sensation that you were falling, drifting? Uh, to, could you describe that some more? Well, I'll, I'll try to describe it as best as I can to you. Uh, there was absolutely no sensation of falling. There was very uh, little sensation of speed other than the same type of sensation that we had in the capsule. And I th would say it would be very similar to flying over the uh, Earth from about 20,000 feet. The, the Earth does, you can't actually see it moving underneath you. Uh, the, I think as I stepped out, I thought the, uh, probably the biggest thing is, was a feeling of accomplishment of one of the goals of the Gemini 4 mission. I believe this was probably in my mind. I guess that's as close as I can give it to you. I can't, i just sorry, I can't give you a feeling of uh, falling or anything because it just wasn't there. Henderson. I uh, had, uh, when you uh, lost the glove, could you tell us how that happened <laughs> and also, uh, uh, could you describe the difficulty you had in getting the hatch door closed and was that related to this little puff of air which uh, jolted it open? No, I don't think that was related, but I, I will go into the glove because it was a fairly uh, interesting thing. I had uh, gone out initially, uh, had planned to use my gloves initially, but uh, we'd also thought that the heat loads that those gloves were designed to protect me against would not be any problem initially because we were just coming out of the night side. So I decided to go ahead and do the work I had to do outside the spacecraft with my gloves off. I felt that I could do it more efficiently and quickly. So I took the gloves off, did the work I had to do, and asked Jim, I said, uh, pass me up my left glove. He handed me up my left glove and I put it on. He asked me uh, as I went out, he said, do you want your right glove? And I said, no, I'll use the, the gun and the equipment. I think I can use it more effectively without the glove on my right hand. I think this was the uh, last that we had the opportunity to do much control on that glove because uh, shortly thereafter while I was out, I looked over my uh, shoulder to the left and it was a very strange sight. There was my glove floating off into uh, space. There just seemed to be a, a bit of a flow out of the spacecraft of uh, air from the environmental control system. The glove got caught in this flow and just drifted right out of the hatch and started drifting right off into space and I was really surprised to see it come back on the film because it was quite a, quite a sight to me and uh, I guess to you people also. The, uh, you asked me, if the last part of the question was to relate the gloves to the hatch problem that we had at the end and I, I think you can say it was a hatch malfunction at the end. We had planned several ways that we knew to close the hatch. The normal method of closing it was for me to hold on to a canvas strap and to use a large lever and ratchet the hatch down. Well, when it got back in and the, I found out that the lever was actually turning free and it wasn't actually ratcheting the hatches down. And so we'd had this problem demonstrated to us before and we knew what, what the trouble was. It was one of the little levers that have to be set so that the gears are set and will actually take up as you pull on the handle. I had to actually act as a little spring in there. I had to go back with my right hand, operate the lever, reach forward, and operate the big handle. And I had one more buddy with me, and he had to actually operate with me on the bar and the lanyard to apply the force to close the hatch.